Hi, this is JB from the Cracktera team in Arc and Lyon. We are glad to be able to present some of our work today, so thanks to the Adobe and the Substance team for inviting us. Today I'll be showing you the way we've been texturing some characters for our next project, Deathloop, and specifically some of the non-player characters or NPCs. So I'll start with a short introduction to the game. I'll explain the brief and constraint we had to create our NPCs, the way we create and organize our materials in Designer, and then we'll have a look at the way we organize our painter file by showing you a direct example of one of our characters. I'll be joined at this stage by Christian Boliarka, Hi. who will show you some of the tools we developed for Painter and the way we use them. A quick word about what this presentation is not. This is not a tutorial about how to create materials. It rather shows the way we organize ourselves to create our materials and texture files. Now, a short introduction to the game. Deathloop is an action-adventure FPS where you play as Colt. You're stuck in a time loop on the island of Black Reef. Your goal is to break this loop, and to do so, you figure out that you need to get rid of eight targets present on the island. I'm showing you two of them in this picture. While doing so, you meet Juliana, your arch nemesis. She'll do anything she can in order to stop you in your journey. The island of Black Reef is a living world occupied by people we call Eternalists, our NPCs. They are the people you will encounter and fight against most of the time while you're on the island. If you ask yourself why people wear masks on the island, since it's a short presentation, I'll keep it very concise. It's to make them both equal and anonymous. There's plenty of information, trailer, screenshots on Bethesda.net slash Deathloop. Now that you know a bit about the game, let's talk about the brief behind the NPC's creation, and more specifically, the textures. The time loop is seen as a big party, some sort of carnival where you can do anything you want. To illustrate this concept, our art director, Sebastian Mitton, had the idea to have the NPCs paint themselves in crazy ways. Leaks, powder, brushstrokes, the character would use any technique available to customize their look. A few keywords and references we had for this, the NPCs need to be stylish, unique, uncommon, and graphically simple. We want them to look simple and readable from a distance, but detailed when you get closer to them. Because we want Black Reef to feel filled with people and all NPCs to look special, we know we'll have to have a large quantity. At the start of the project, we estimated that a minimum of 100 NPCs would be needed. We actually have 160 unique. NPCs, not counting the targets and the special ones. Here are some concepts we use provided by the team. These examples are paint over on top of our high-res models. For most of them, we could replicate them and just tweak the colors here and there. But from the beginning, we knew that the concept team would not have the manpower to design and iterate on 100 plus NPCs, since there's plenty of other subjects to tackle in parallel so we knew we'd have some iteration done directly in Painter. These are the main challenges to focus on from the kickoff discussion we had about our NPCs. We know we need a lot of variation, but only a part of the team will be dedicated to this task. The team is also working on weapons, heroes, hero variation, player models, targets. On this project, two people would texture all the NPCs. We know we will have some iteration phase, especially at the beginning to find our visual language, and in the end to make all characters feel homogenic. So tweaking needs to be fast and easy. We will have different painting type on top of cloth and need to develop specific tools to be efficient. So a few solutions. We need a strong base material that's easy to use and get you a good result fast. Organized painter file to support quick and easy iteration, and some custom painting tools. Here you can see some high res version of the NPCs about to be textured. They have some complex and detailed areas, but also some plain spaces to support our painting layer. In this picture, I've chosen the simplest model we have in the game to show you some texture variation. And during the time loop, we spawn NPCs with a low amount of paint in the morning. Around midday, they have a bit more paint, and in the evening, they're fully covered. This feels subtle while playing, but it shows some sort of crescendo in the party, and the end of the day feels crazier than the early morning. 
last picture here from a simple mockup on the left to the final idea on the right, an example of the quick iteration we went through in Painter. You might notice a sort of pigeon drop effect on the second one that did make it in the final design. So let's dive into Substance Designer's material now. Here I opened our Leather Master for you. The master is the entity that gathers all the subparts of a material. I'll explain all the different parts that make a master material. As you can see, we have some texture input, some generator, and a material that goes into several modifiers. And here, of course, we have our outputs. So we'll start with the beginning, we'll start with the core material. The core is the essence of the material, where the base textures are created. The core uses procedural noises or bitmap as inputs, and it's entirely tileable. It gives you the most basic option you need for your material, and we don't have any geometry input in the core. At Arcane, the core has been designed to be a common base between the character art and the environment art team. And then in the character art team, we add modifiers on top that are specific to us. As you can see, the core is pretty simple. We start with some bitmaps for the height, add a color selector, some procedural noises with different tiling ratios, mix some noises to get roughness variation. I'm not going into details of what each node is doing since it's pretty basic stuff, just giving you an overall look. What you see in the red frames is what we expose. So let's have a look at the preview of the core. You can see I can change the color, I can change the tiling ratio. In this case, I've got two types of leather. I've got some rotation, roughness presets, and height elevation. We won't see the effect of the height in Designer, but in Painter, it makes our material sit higher than other if we need to in certain transitions. After the core comes the alter. Its function is to alter the core according to some map inputs. So for the demo, let me plug some texture input. Three options are added to the core and linked to it. So the noise factor adds an extra noise on top of the core with a different scale to break up any repetition in the pattern in case you have large surfaces. The noise tiling gives us an extra tiling ratio just for the alter. And then we can highlight the edges with a tint that is relative to the cores one. If I open the alter, you can see it takes the core as an input, adds some procedural noises, also mixes the mesh texture, and modifies my channel in a pretty simple way. Now that we saw the core and the alter, let's have a look at the wear. So the wear comes as a group, and the wear adds some damage to the material, and I divided it into three subcategories. So you have the polish, the blemish, and the tarnish. The polish gives a luster to the material. The blemish is to do more with age. So in this case, it's the sun affecting the material. And then we have the tarnish. The tarnish is when you damage the surface of the material. It can be a bit abstract right now, but I'll show you all three in action. And let's start with the polish. The polish adds an extra noise and alters the albedo and roughness to add that luster idea. In this example, it's linked to a grunge map, but you could easily imagine after testing the material to add it according to a curvature, a position, or anything you come up with. To make the update, of a generator more efficient, I have separated it. Even if I haven't touched the material for a year or two, I know where to go to update it. The other benefit of separating the generator is that I can mutualize them. So a tarnish of a gold and a copper could have the same generator, for example. OK, so if I open the polish node, similar recipe to the rest, I add some extra noise that affect all my channels. And here at the bottom, I've got my generator acting as a mask. If I zoom in in the blend section, I have 
my input in the middle, my modified input on the top, and then my generator that acts as a mask. You might have noticed that my generator is also linked to a user input, and this is blended in add sub mode, meaning that in Painter, I will be able to add some polish where I want to, but also to remove some if I need. So for the demo, if I add a text input instead of the user input, you'll see 100% of the polish appear if the text is white, and then it will progressively disappear if I change the value. Since it's in add sub mode, if I turn my value to black, I'll be removing the result of my procedural generator. This way, I have a total control of my mask if required. Then comes the blemish that sits on top of the polish, and this way acts as a bleach effect. So imagine the sun hitting the surface for a long time. As you can see in the preview, sometimes there's really not a lot of options per modifier, but it's the accumulation of all of them that makes it a versatile material. So I'll skip the exploration of the blemish since it's pretty similar to the other modifier, and let's jump directly on the last one. So the tarnish is a bit more complex than the other two modifiers. It illustrates the leather surface being grated, if you want, so it reveals the layer under the leather. I can make it appear along the edge or using a grunge map, or as seen just before with a custom input, of course. The revealed layer is independent to the core since it's considered a new material, so I've got presets for it. I can make it darker, lighter, or use a custom color if I want to. You can see gradients around the worn areas. This part of the tarnish is still linked to the core. So in the tarnish, I'm combining two effects if you want. I've got the fully grated area and then the slightly altered area around the grated one. So in the first part, you can see I tweak the hue and the roughness like on the other modifiers. And I also add a bit of height to get a slight bump around the grated area. And then for the grated area itself, I've got a separate texture showing. So the tiling is still linked to the core, but in this case, the color and roughness are separated. I use a level to rearrange my input, where I say from value 0 to 1 to 8, my first effect appears, and then from 1 to 8 to 255, my second one does. If I plug a text in the user input, 100% of my tarnish will appear, revealing the underlayer of the leather. If I blur my texture, you'll notice both tarnish values working together. And if I tweak the value, of course, it can progressively appear or disappear. The idea behind the master material and the benefit of having all modifiers into the same material is that they're all linked together. So if I change the tint or the tiling of the core, all my modifier will follow accordingly. And also in Painter, we only have one layer with the material, as opposed to a pile of separate materials. And in our case, this way of working really fits our workflow. Now that we had a look at one material in detail, let's just quickly open another one, in this case, the brass. So straight away, you see it's organized the exact same way. Also, if you have a look at the preview, you'll notice that we have very similar structure to the leather. The idea here is that if you're used to work with one master material, working with another one should feel very familiar. So tiling or generic preset in the core, some alter that uses my texture as input, and then my polish modifier, blemish, and tarnish. And just like in the leather tarnish, the brass one is based out of two effects. This uniform organization takes a bit of time to set up and to adapt to your project, but it can be a good long-term investment. So a few takeaways to close up this part. A readable and homogenic structure. This helps the user getting used to the option and where to find them in the material. It also helps material owner to find their way efficiently and fast, even a long time after having created the materials. And secondly, a versatile use. 
The same material can be used with a quick drag and drop test, just tweaking the values of the core. It can be altered or worn if necessary. And then for star asset, we can freely hand paint all modifiers. Okay, so now let's jump into Painter. Before I show you an example of the organization of the NPC file, let's just have a quick look at a master material in Painter. So the challenge in making these materials uh, is that we want them to be used for small details, like belt buckle, for example, but also star items, like a weapon. So a simple drag and drop of an iron material in the gun should already give me OK results. And if I go in the options, I've got my familiar parameters. If I want a quick test, or if it's a small surface, I can just tweak the core. If I want to invest a bit more time, I can explore some of the other parameters. I know my Polish, Blemish, Tarnish modifiers, and I can anticipate what they will do. Sometimes materials have three modifiers, sometimes only one or two. It really depends on the nature of them. And after I've set up my sliders, if I think I still need to go further into details, I can create specific masks to show and hide my wear. I can create a layer, add a paint, and an anchor point, and hook the anchor to my material. In the texture setting, I created two user channels, Tarnish and Blemish in this case. And this allows me to paint all my custom masks in the same place, and it makes it really easy to come back to the file if I need to. Now finally, let's have a look at one of our NPCs in Painter. I'll go through all the folders one by one. At the bottom of the pile, we have the Atlas folder. Uh, this one goes with the Painter layer, and it will be explained by Chris in a minute. The wear layer is present if the artist feels it's necessary to modify our wear generator, as we saw on the gun example. The base color folder gathers all the color of the character, mask by ID. If I ask an artist to quickly do a test with a red jacket and blue gloves, they straight away know where to go. For the NPCs, we have color presets, since we wanted to keep a reduced color palette for the cloth and go a bit crazier with the paint layer that sits on top. The details folder is a folder where the artist could paint color variation by hand. This is not relative to the base color and only done when we're sure about the tints and global design of the NPC. So typically it's the pass you do when you polish the character. It gives the artists the freedom they need to add life and subtleties to a diffuse texture, and it allows them to feel free to add variation where they need to. Then comes the texture folder, where we import all of our master materials. As opposed to what we saw in Designer, in Painter, the material sits on top of the color in overlay mode to keep the color independent from the material. So each material contains all the parameters we've seen previously, if I decide to change the blemish parameter of my leather, I know where to go. I can adjust the slider until I'm happy with the result. If I decide to change the leather for a cloth, it's nice and easy. I just go and fetch my cloth master material, and then I can tweak the core to start with in order to get a quick idea of what it feels like. Then I can go ahead and tweak my other parameters to get a result I'm comfortable with. In this case, I'll update the blemish parameter once more and add some details on the creases of my jacket. I like what the blemish modifiers give me, but I feel I have too much in certain areas and not enough in others. So I can tell my material to use a wear anchor point and hook it up. Then I go into my wear paint layer and I add or remove some of the effects. If I need to change my cloth back to leather because my lead or my art director can't decide what he wants, this is not a problem. And if I want to retain the wear I've been painting previously, 
I can hook back the anchor to this new material. The idea of completely separating the color from the material came up while working on Dishonored 2. Originally, our guards had white shirts and we decided to turn them green to have them looking more readable in certain streets area. Our textures were made in Photoshop and a lot of information was baked into the color. It wasn't very flexible and it took more than a day to update. If you think about it, one day of work for a color tweak is mad and not acceptable. Later on, we decided to make an elite version, turning the green shirt into red, and the same thing happened again. Now imagine having to update the cloth pattern. This would have meant basically redoing the whole texture. This is where the separation between color and materials come from, and it proved really useful on death loop since we tried a lot of color combinations. Now let's have Chris explain all about the Paint and Atlas tool. Hey, this is Chris. I have opened the same painter file as JB and will present to you the painting tools we've created for painter in order to help us create the painted shapes we have for all the NPCs of that loop. The tools are composed out of a filter, an atlas and a custom brush. As an input, the filter takes some custom color IDs the artist will apply with our custom brush in painter. This filter allows us to change the tints of the strokes after we apply them onto the character by extracting masks from the colors IDs and recreating a substance material with colors we chose in the filters options. We also have option to create the metallic, the roughness or some custom channels like the flakes that we have on certain characters and weapons. Now for the atlas. When starting this pipeline, we didn't have access to UDIM, so we thought about creating the Atlas. The Atlas helps us tweak the tints and properties of our brush strokes in one single place and for all the different texture sets. The Atlas is an instance layer and it actually controls the options of the filter. This way, we can modify a color from one single place and it will be updating into the other texture sets. The Atlas is a substance designer material with output only on the base color that has exposed parameters. When changing one of these parameters, the beat map of the Atlas will change and the filter by using a pixel processor to sample the Atlas image, it's updating the tints, the metallic or roughness properties, whatever we choose to change actually. On top of the main color, we have two extra color variations that we can play with. This helps us create variety, gradients, and rich color combinations. The variations have their own metallic and roughness properties as well. To paint the strokes, we use custom brushes. We have a paint brush, a spray brush, a roller brush, for example, all painting colors like this. The artist can paint with different looking strokes, or he can control the influences of the variation color when painting, just by changing some sliders. As you can see, the roller brush has different sliders that controls the properties of the strokes. Here I can set up my brush to have more paint gathering on the sides of the roll for example. Because I'm painting with IDs, if I paint the black strokes with my roller brush and we then decide that this stroke should be a metallic paint like copper, it is easy for me to go to the atlas for that paint and change it. We have other custom brushes like the paint brush you can see here. I can control when painting the influences of the variation colors or the height of the stroke. We have a spray brush that also paints color IDs. This is it for our custom painter tools. I'd like to take the opportunity to mention Claudio Tanasie, who took part in the conception of this process. JB is now taking over for the remaining explanations. Okay, back to our folders. The dirt folder contains materials like mud or grime we made using the same process. They're all master materials. 
At the top of the pile, we have our last folder. The bake blend filter, where we bake a small amount of position or curvature into the albedo. And we also add a bit of complementary color. And since it's a filter, the color is relative to the albedo. Then we have a finalizer to make sure our texture are in range with our BPR settings by shifting extreme values. Like in many projections, when you start your project, you might not know what your exact BPR ranges are. So this finalizer helps us tweaking and rebatching all textures if needed. Some takeaways to end up this painted chapter. A readable and homogenic structure. Just like in Designer, keeping your painter file nice and tidy greatly helps being efficient when iterating. It allows the artist to find their way in the file they haven't created themselves or after a long period of time. Custom tools. Investing time to develop custom tools can be a big plus when working on a large amount of assets and prove very useful in this loop. Being efficient allowed us to test more things and ultimately to feel more creative. Now, a few images to close up this session. Here's a few NPCs that went through that exact same process. They are readable and simple from a distance. Details reveal themselves when zooming in. And because our materials are procedural and made with designer, the entire character can be treated with a good amount of life and details. And since we have a good structure in Painter, any potential modification would be fairly straightforward. Thanks to all the people involved in this presentation. I hope certain ideas and processes can be useful to you and possibly adapted to your project. In our case, this way of working proved useful and fluid. It helped prevent any crunch or overtime, which was really important to me. I apologize for not going into details in certain areas. We tried to keep this presentation broad and mainly talk about our general organization. We designed this process to be sustainable over a long time and we'll carry on updating and optimizing our library. Thanks for watching and have a great GDC.